Welcome to our webinar, and we're excited to have you here today. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us. We partnered with the Options Clearing Corporation, or OCC, to bring you this webinar today on understanding option callers. My name is Gina Bokayas, and I'm on the management team of Regal Securities, which is the parent company of eOption and InvestTrade. So some quick housekeeping items. The session today will last approximately one hour. Everyone on this call is muted. We ask that you take a moment to look at your screen and identify the Q&A button. You'll use this, this button to enter any questions you have during the session. And at the very end of his presentation, our speaker will answer all of your questions um, in the Q&A box. We ask that you not use the chat room for questions or raise your hand as our speaker won't be able to see those. So make sure to put any and all questions in the Q&A box. You can also reach out to our live support desk at any time if you have additional questions after the webinar. We're happy to help and answer any questions that you have about option trading or trading in, in particular. And to tell you a bit about eOption, as our name implies, we're a brokerage firm that specializes in stock and options trading. And we offer you some of the lowest commission rates in the country, including zero commission for stocks and ETFs, and options are just 10 cents per contract, one of the lowest rates around. Our founder was one of the founding members of the Chicago Board Options Exchange and has been an active stock and options trader for over 45 years. He created his ideal trading company that caters to serious traders and those who have a passion for investing. At eOption, we support trading education and we encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel to see our library of trading videos, no matter what level of investing you're at. You can go to youtube.com slash eOption and take a moment to subscribe right now. And if you subscribe, you'll also be notified as soon as a copy of this recording is available. I'd like to turn your attention to our speaker now, Ed Madla from the Options Clearing Corp. And we'd like to welcome him back. Ed has been a popular speaker who's been working with us for the last few years, and some of you may recognize his name. He has over 20 years of experience in the financial industry, including as a market maker at the Chicago Board Options Exchange and the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and as an independent trader of stock, stocks, options, and futures. He currently works as executive director of investor education at the Options Clearing Corp, where he oversees retail education programs and has a lead position in the production of options curriculum for the Options Industry Council. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Ed Madla. Thank you. Thanks, Gina, for the introduction. Always good to be here. And I want to commend uh, you and your team at uh, eOption for how you cater to the options investor. It's always good to see uh, being someone who has spent their entire career in the options industry. Uh, glad to be here and speak to your audience. A little bit about myself. I started in the industry back in the late 1990s as an options market maker uh, on the trading floor in the open outcry environment uh, in the trading pits of uh, Chicago and New York for a few of the largest uh, options market making firms in the business. Uh, and then I evolved like just about everyone else did when the trading floor started to disappear into the electronic trading environment, uh, trading stocks, options, and futures, as Gina said. Uh, but now almost seven years here with OCC um, doing education. I didn't see myself uh, as a teacher or as an educator, but I got started in 2014 and have really enjoyed it. Uh, working with OCC, uh, delivering presentations like this to everybody who participates with options and wants to listen. That's individual investors, financial advisors, money managers, institutional investors. Uh, we speak to all of those audiences here uh, at OCC. Today's topic, understanding options collars. It is uh, predominantly a protective strategy, but we'll break it apart and uh, show you what the pieces look like, the risk profile, uh, along with a few other key details. First, our disclaimer, options are a complex tool that need to be understood before being used in a live account. And just briefly about OIC and who we are, founded back in 1992, so that's coming up on our 30 year anniversary. Uh, OIC was formed as an industry cooperative between exchanges and firms who wanted free unbiased education from a source that really doesn't sell anything. We don't offer brokerage services. We're not licensed to give advice. Uh, we strictly provide uh, education, straightforward education on both the benefits and risks. We stress both, and you'll hear that today, benefits and risks of the product. Uh, we're not here to sell options to you either. 
We just want to educate uh, and uh, allow you to make an informed decision on, on how to use options and, and if to use them. Here's our website if you want to check out our education. Uh, we've got a plenty of podcasts, uh, videos, and webinars just like this one that we're going to hear today. And our investor education team can be reached by email. Another free service, former traders and brokers. I manage this team. Here's the email address. You can jot that down if you have questions about today's presentation or anything else options related without asking us for advice. Uh, send an email to us and our team. We'll be glad to help you out. Uh, the outline today is going to include a little bit of everything. I'm going to touch on some basics for those of you who might need that. Of course, it never hurts to brush up on some basic material. Uh, we'll pretty much get to that in these first two segments on protective puts and covered calls with some added commentary. Then we'll look at the collar and what that construction is all about, uh, along with variations, sort of taking that standard collar and doing other things with it. I always enjoy uh, including a, a segment like this in presentations. Uh, so we should touch on uh, every skill level here, whether you're brand new to options or seasoned. Uh, we'll get to different things here. I'll also include, uh, when I talk about collars, we'll also get into implied volatility and volatility skew. Uh, I usually get to that in just about any presentation I give. It's such uh, an integral piece of the options product. It's hard to avoid some level of discussion about implied volatility when you're talking about any strategy. So we'll get that, we'll get that uh, conversation started uh, in the back half of today's presentation. So let's start with uh, these two rather basic, uh, simple strategies of protective puts, and then we'll do covered calls. I'm sure many of you are familiar with these, uh, but we will outline them to make sure we're on the same page uh, and then look at some of the more uh, intricate details within each. Uh, first of all, to back up all the way to the ground floor, let's remind ourselves that option buyers have paid for rights, whether it's calls or puts. They've paid for rights and sellers have been paid to take on obligations. In the case of puts, the buyers have paid premium in effort to own the right to sell shares at the strike price of the option, the strike price that they have chosen. And again, they've paid the premium to the seller. Uh, forgetting about protective puts for just a moment, as an outright trade, a put buyer is bearish on the underlying, owning of the right to sell shares at the strike price. If the stock were to sell off to lower and lower levels, the, uh, the share price decline would have a positive influence on the value of the put option that they have purchased. I said that carefully because we all know, we all who trade options know that the, uh, the passage of time and changes in volatility levels also has an impact. So it's not a guarantee that share price is going down, it's going to increase the value of the put. Um, but uh, again, to choose those words carefully, the share price going down, that bearish movement will have a positive influence on the value of the put option. And that's what the put buyer uh, is trying to accomplish. So by itself, buying puts is bearish. Now, if it's taken till expiration and the put is in the money, meaning the put strike is higher than where the stock is currently trading, uh, the put buyer could exercise their option and receive cash in the amount of their strike times 100 and deliver 100 shares of stock. Uh, again, if, if it's just the put speculator buying a put option, undoubtedly they have no interest in exercising their option uh, because that would leave them with a short stock position, uh, probably not a position they want to have if they're even allowed to have it. Uh, so put buyers who are speculating are, uh, are undoubtedly attempting to open the trade by paying the premium and then subsequently selling the option for more than they paid for it, never taking it to expiration, never dealing with exercise and assignment. Uh, and in fact, a broader comment about the options industry, it's often a myth that people hear, uh, which is that most options expire worthless, uh, which indicates that you should be selling them because most of them expire worthless. It's actually a myth and it is not true. Uh, statistics from, o uh, from OCC uh, continue to show uh, very consistent numbers from one year to the next. Uh, about 70% of all options that are opened are closed before ever reaching expiration, the profitability of which is impossible to determine uh, because premium amounts are not tracked in such a way. So 70% are closed before ever getting to expiration. Of those that are held to expiration, 
and held through expiration, yes, the vast majority of those expire worthless. Uh, and that makes sense because uh, if you're going to hold through expiration, it's probably because you can't sell it for anything. The put or the call has gone to zero. You can't sell it. There's no value there. Uh, so that, that makes up about 20% of the overall open options. 20% are held through expiration and expire worthless. And the remaining 10% get exercised at some point. We'll talk about exercise a little more deeper when we get to cover calls. Uh, so that's quite a bit there on put buying as we're looking at the speculative trader. Uh, let's shift gears now and talk about buying puts and owning these rights associated with owning a put from a protective perspective. And the protection could be to potentially limit losses on a stock position, or if you have a stock position that has rallied, you could be uh, attempting to protect gains or even lock in gains uh, by buying a put option after you've experienced a rally. So let's look at this protective put uh, to distinguish from the put speculator who is bearish. The protective put investor is bullish on a stock they already own. They think the share price is going higher, but they wanna protect against a downside move, risk management. There's other things you can do here. You can scale down the position. You can utilize a stop loss. And I'll talk about and compare those in just a minute. But buying a put is one of those choices which can precisely establish a price at which you can sell the shares if you need to, uh, if needed, meaning the share price does decline significantly and you want to exit the position. The put option gives you the comfort of knowing you can get out at the strike price of the option at which you purchased. Uh, that's utilizing the right to sell stock at that strike price. There's some comparisons to make between a protective put and an insurance policy. When you buy insurance on a home or a car, you are paying premium up front, just as you're paying premium here for the options contract. Uh, you also have an expiration date on the insurance policy, just like you have an expiration date on an option. And you have this uh, term called the deductible. How much out of pocket do you have to pay before the insurance starts its coverage? Uh, same concept here with the options. The deductible would be calculated as the difference between today's uh, stock price and the strike price of the option. That gap, that movement lower, you are willing to give up. That's going out of pocket. Uh, further declines below the strike price are then protected. That's, that's the deductible there uh, within the protective put. Uh, and of course, the amount of the deductible and the length of the insurance policy go a long way towards deciding and driving uh, how much it's going to cost you. A lower deductible is going to mean a higher strike price. That's going to cost you more. Uh, a longer period of protection is going to cost more. And uh, that decision on strike and expiration is going to differ from one investor to the next. And it probably is gonna differ on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on your confidence level in your market outlook and your risk tolerance. You have to ask yourself, how much protection do I want? How long do I want it? And whether you're a fundamental or technical trader or both, uh, your analysis and your concern about the market might lead you to decide just how much you want to pay, how much of a deductible are you willing to endure, and how long you want that insurance uh, to be in place. Let's look at an example on a PL graph of protected put. We have the stock trading at $80 a share in our example. And to protect that position, we buy the 75 strike put option and we pay our premium out of pocket $2.70 for that protection. Uh, and for this purposes, this is not protecting gains. We bought the stock at 80. Uh, maybe it's just sitting there. It's not moving. It's consolidating. We're still bullish, but all of a sudden we're concerned that something breaks down. So we want that protection in place. And now here's where I'll, I'll discuss the alternatives. Uh, if you have shares at 80 uh, and you're now concerned, you could scale down. You could sell some of your position and that would also reduce your risk. Uh, you don't have to pay for that. You don't have to pay the $2.70. Remember, that's $270 for 
for each option uh, written on 100 shares. Scaling down doesn't cost you anything, um, but if the shares were to rally, uh, particularly rally significantly, your lower sized position would not benefit as much. And that's what you give up uh, potentially when you size down. Um, and perhaps the, the more direct comparison that most investors think of is, well, why should I buy a protected put and pay for an option that's going to expire when I could just put in a stop loss at 75 and not have to pay for that? And in theory, not have it expire, uh, knowing that when certain orders expire, you can just re-enter them at no cost. And, and you certainly could do that. Uh, the stop loss at 75 is a viable alternative, uh, but a couple of things to say that could be uh, di uh, could differentiate between the two. First of all, uh, well, as I said, the benefit of the stop loss, it doesn't expire, doesn't cost anything. So there are two huge benefits for choosing the stop loss. The benefits of the protective put come in a, different, a couple of different forms as well. First of all, it's round the clock protection. A stop loss isn't working for you and will not execute during after hours uh, market activity or over the weekend. And we do know that the market moves based on news that comes out from a uh, economic or political or military perspective. And those, that news can come out at any time from anywhere around the world. And it would not be the first time we've seen you know, the markets open up, say, on a Monday morning already having crashed. And that stop loss at 75 might not get filled at 75 if the stock happens to open up on a Monday morning uh, 10 or 20 percent lower. Um, the stop loss also would get filled if you have a flash crash. If the, if the share price here at 80 all of a sudden quickly dropped down to 74, 73, and then quickly rebounded, now your put option is there. You don't have to exercise it. It's not going to get executed. Your protection is in place a stop loss is going to get triggered and exit the position as soon as the stock gets there, not giving you time to hold, to watch, and to see possibly a rebound in the share price. And the last thing that I'll say that might lead you to favor the put option is if you are an investor who sometimes struggles with the psychology of getting out of a bad trade. Uh, I've always long, uh, long stated that the most difficult trade anyone has to make is exiting a losing position. I say that with an awful lot of experience uh, having uh, orders in, particularly when I started trading futures on my own and I was scalping futures as a day trader. Um, I did that for many years, but in the beginning, it was very difficult uh, to keep that discipline to get out of trades once the losses started to mount. It is so easy to get into a trade, say by buying shares at 80, putting in your stop loss at 75, and you see that share price come down to 77, 76, and you think, you know what? It really is gonna bounce here. I'm gonna drop that stop loss down to 73. Next thing you know, the share's at 74, and you do it again, and you think, wow, it's really got support here. It's gonna bounce. I don't wanna get out of this trade and take a big loss. You drop your stop down to 70, and guess what? You're triggered at 70, and now all of a sudden, you've lost a lot more money than you ever thought you would. Uh, if you struggle with that, if you struggle with that discipline, and believe me, we've all been there, um, the protective put more or less forces you to get out at that price you told yourself that you would get out before you have that opportunity to sort of break your rules and start moving your stop losses down. Uh, all the while, keep in mind the negative aspects of using the options piece, which is the cost and the expiration date. The fact that it expires and if you want to continue the protection after that, you have to keep paying for it. Two reasons uh, to shy away from the option, but like I said, several reasons, I believe, to consider uh, the put option uh, compared to your other choices. Let's look at covered calls now. Uh, without a doubt, I'm sure everybody here knows what the covered call is, so I won't spend too much time on the construction, uh, but very briefly, this is a two-sided position that involves writing or selling uh, an equity call contract for each 100 shares owned. If you don't have 100 shares, you cannot sell a call option. Or if you have 150 shares, you cannot sell two call options. Uh, that would not be covered. The word covered, by the way, uh, is, uh, is actually descriptive. Uh, it means that the obligation associated with your short call contracts is covered by the shares you already own. So for each 100 shares, 
you can sell a call contract. Uh, the goal here is simply to increase returns through the premium received. The call premium received is the benefit. It, it could increase your returns. It generates income. It improves your break-even point. That's synonymous with improving the likelihood of success on the trade. A lot of good reasons to use covered calls. That's why they're so popular. On the flip side, you give up potential far upside gains if the stock were to rally sharply. You do have to make sure that you're always entering positions that are consistent with your market outlook. And I want to point that out here because uh, investors can sometimes fall into a trap. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm not exclusive of this group. I've been there as well. Uh, when something works regularly over and over and over again, you start to think, well, this strategy is, is really good and it's working. and I'm showing great gains. And then it becomes a habit just to implement it over and over and over again, sort of in a blind fashion. Uh, just be careful with that. There's nothing wrong with having a strategy and doing it time and time again. But remember that the covered call is neutral to bullish. It does not offer too much protection to the downside. It's very similar to being long shares of stock. And if you're concerned about the market, if there is a bearish move, if there is a significant crash, the covered call is not going to work out too well. And we'll see that on the, uh, the P&L graph when we get there in a couple of slides. Just want to talk about the obligations. Uh, again, I'm sure you all know that when you sell a call option, you're obligated to sell shares at the strike price of the option if you're assigned. And that strike selection is going to be um, a result of a couple of things. One, how far do you think the stock might go? Because you don't want to give up the upside. You want to select a strike price that you do not think the stock is going to go through. But then also, once you've determined that level, you want to make sure the premium that you're receiving is worthwhile. That if you're going to take on these obligations associated with the short call, the premium you're getting paid is worth taking on those obligations. I'm going to spend a minute here regarding assignments, the obligation to sell shares for American style options. Equity options are American style, has nothing to do with geography. American style means that exercise and assignment activity can take place on any trading day up to and including expiration day. That's in contrast to European style, where exercise and assignment activity only takes place on expiration. Equity options are American style. Uh, assignment is possible on any time before expiration up to including expiration day in the absence of dividends. So stick with me here. In the absence of dividends, it is unlikely to be assigned early. Think about the option holder's perspective. Uh, if the option, if the call option holder would like to continue their long bullish trade, uh, they certainly don't need to exercise early to continue that trade. They can just hold the call option and continue to enjoy gains to the upside if the shares were to rally. If they were to exercise early, they would be paying cash before they need to and they'd be taking on more downside risk before they need to. So early expiration for the call holder who wants to continue their position is unlikely in the absence of dividends. Now, if the call holder wants to exit and get out of the trade completely, they're done with it. The stock's made its move. They're ready to, to go on to another trade. Again, they don't need to exercise and then buy shares and sell the shares to close that position. They can just uh, simply sell to close the call option they own and move on. Neither of those involves exercising early. The circumstance of dividends does change that a little bit. Remember what it means to be a call holder. You are not a shareholder. You're not entitled to a dividend payment if you are a call holder. And you also know that on the X dividend date, the stock price is going to drop by the dividend amount. Uh, if you own an in-the-money call, specifically in the money, where the call strike is below where the stock is, and you have an upcoming um, uh, ex-dividend date, uh, then you certainly might consider exercising early to become a shareholder of record on the record date to be paid the dividend rather than suffer uh, the loss in share price that you would experience if you owned the call option. As a covered call writer who is short the calls, this is something you want to be aware of and expect. If the option is in the money, 
the day prior to the ex-dividend date would be the highest likelihood of being assigned early. You can't say for sure. It's still the choice of the call holder whether they want to exercise or not. Uh, but certainly you could say they have financial interest in exercising early given that circumstance, especially as the option is deeper and deeper in the money. Uh, the, the call writer in this case would need to expect that early assignment to take place. So got an example of the covered call strategy. Here we have uh, 100 shares owned at 75. And we can say the same as before we bought shares at 75, we were bullish, stock's not going anywhere. Uh, it's just sitting here at 75. We're not getting that upward movement we wanted to. So we're starting to get a little concerned and we've now uh, adjusted our forecast a bit. And we're just looking for a bit of a move, 75 to 80, you know, what's that $5, about six, uh, Six plus percent move to the upside would be as much as we're looking for. Uh, so we sell the 80 strike call, willingly taking on the obligation to sell the shares that we own at the strike price of 80, and we are paid premium. So again, those two pieces, how high might the stock go? We're going to decide 80. We really don't think it's going above 80. So there's our strike price. And then we look to see how much premium can we get for that? And we have a dollar eighty, and we decide that's worth it. I'm going to take a dollar eighty. Now the break-even point or cost basis on the position is seventy-three twenty. It's reduced. That's lower risk. That's a better break-even point. That's a higher likelihood of being successful. A wider range of profitability as compared to just owning stock. In exchange for that, we give up the far upside. Now, for those of you who trade covered calls regularly. I do want to talk about one piece to this, which is management on the upside. You know, for what it's worth, when the stock drops, you know, you really have to pay attention to your risk tolerance, your market outlook. It's, it's very similar to just being long stock. Uh, the covered call offers a little protection to the downside, but not too much. So you have to be concerned about that big move. But here on the upside, this is something that I think gets lost a bit. If the stock were to rally, let's say significantly, now, this is not what we want to happen, but what if it, what if it did? What if the stock went right to 90 for whatever reason? It just popped to 90 and we've still got two or three weeks left until expiration. But we're going to want to track how much time value is left in the 80 strike call. Time value, not total value, time value. When the time value in the 80 call disappears, then we have already reached our maximum gain on the position. We'll say in this case, $680. Now, how would you determine that? If the stock was at 90, we know that the 80 strike call has $10 of intrinsic value. Any premium above 10 is time value. If we check our options quotes on our e-option platform and we see that the market in this option is 990 bid offered at 1010, there's no time value there. It's all gone. We've already reached our maximum gain. Even if we have two or three weeks to go, there's no more time decay that we're going to experience here. If you find yourself in that position, it's a good time to consider exiting, closing the position and reallocating your capital because with no more time decay possible, you have a position which has all risk and no reward. Uh, now, you're, you're likely, if you do exit that position, you're likely not going to be able to extract every penny out of this potential gain. Uh, I would expect you could enter this in as one trade, selling stock and buying the call option in one piece at one singular price. But whatever profit you extract here, it's likely going to be very, very close to your maximum gain, but not exactly there. Uh, but regardless, um, if you do find yourself there, track that premium, track the time value that's left. It's going to keep disappearing as the stock rallies further and further to the upside. And when that time value really disappears, um, not too many investors are comfortable holding a position that has nothing left to gain, but still has risk. If the stock were to retreat and something bad were to happen, uh, you could stand to lose money. So be, be wary of that. Now, one other thing to say about the covered call before we move on is uh, sort of strike selection. How do you put this trade together? There's all sorts of different ways you can do it. But one thing that I do hear from investors is they, uh, uh, they get a feel, they, they form an opinion on what they're looking for very generally with respect to how much premium they're getting 
with respect to uh, the, the share price or uh, we'll say an, an annualized return. Uh, this is a quick calculation that you could do, annualized return of the covered call as it's constructed. You can do this in a couple of, uh, I'll say a couple of different ways. Uh, annualized return is, is just a way to calculate what would my profit be on a percentage annualized basis if the stock were unchanged, for example, or your other choice is if the stock is called away, what would my annualized profit be? And I'm not going to get into to specific numbers because it would get confusing, but this is one way for you to perhaps evaluate various covered call opportunities and form an opinion and choose maybe a trade A versus trade B or trade C. And I'll give you a very generic example. I'll say right up front, this is not an endorsement recommendation. I'm just trying to be very simple in describing the type of method you could use. Uh, for example, if you're a short-term trader, and you're, you're selling weekly calls against stock, you might have a very generic uh, strategy that says, well, I like to go one week out uh, from my expiration date. And I like to go 1% out of the money. And then I'm going to calculate what annualized return is that 1% out of the money option with one week until expiration giving me if the stock doesn't move, if it's unchanged, what premium is that really giving back to me? You can calculate that annualized percentage. I'm not going to say what a good number is because it's going to be different for everybody, but you can calculate that uh, simply by taking the premium you received, uh, dividing that by your cost uh, of capital, and then annualizing that number, that annualized calculation. Again, I'm not going to walk through all that, but it's, it's rather simple to do. Uh, take what profit you would have achieved, divided by your cost of capital up front, and then annualize that out. And it can help you decide from, uh, from one trade to the next, keeping in mind that the, the higher premium, um, higher annualized return trades uh, mean the market is pricing in the possibility for greater volatility. That doesn't mean you yourself have to agree with the market. And there is, uh, is where I'm, I'm saying you could have a possible trade. Uh, if you're getting offered 40% uh, annualized return on one trade and 25% annualized return on another, uh, it's not so simple to say, well, I'm going to take the bigger trade of 40%, um, but you might feel in your market analysis that that 40% level is not justified, that those two trades have just as much risk. I'm going to take the higher premium. Uh, in another circumstance, you might feel that the 40% trade is on a very volatile stock, and that's not enough. And you'd rather take the smaller amount, 25% annualized return trade, because in your mind, that stock has far less risk and far less uh, potential for loss. Uh, just, just one way that you can uh, try to form some guidelines on how you're selecting strike expiration and what kind of premium you might be looking for uh, again, knowing that each trade is going to be unique to itself and a little bit different. Uh, I'm going to pause here before I get to collars. I'm just going to take a look and see uh, what kind of questions we have here in Q&A. Uh, let's see. Uh, well, here's two. I see a couple of questions uh, might be specific to e-option, but here's one. Since you sold to open, uh, would you have to buy to close? If the stock went up to 80, wouldn't you have to spend more to buy it back, wiping out any profit? So specific to this trade here, uh, the question is asking if the stock were to rally, would you have to buy to close your option? Yes, you would. Uh, and the question is further saying, wouldn't you have to spend more to buy back this call option taking a loss? Yes. But here's where, where it gets interesting. This is the covered call. Remember, the stock is, is your driving force of profitability. If the stock goes from 75 to 80, you've made $5 on your stock position. Uh, you will have to buy back the 80 call. I can't say how much that's gonna be because depending on how much time has passed, maybe the 80 call is trading for 50 cents. If there's only a few days left till expiration, maybe it's trading for a dollar. If the stock goes from 75 to 80 today, immediately, yeah, maybe you have to pay uh, $2.50 or $3 to buy it back. But whatever it is, 
your profit on the stock is going to outweigh any possible losses you would have on the call option. If the stock went all the way up to 90, yes, it's true. You're going to have to pay $10 to get this call back. You're going to look at that and say, well, I sold it for $1.80. I'm paying $10 to buy it back. Yes, that's true. But remember, your stock is the driving force of profitability. Your stock went from 75 up to 90, $15 higher on the stock, you know, $8.20 higher on the option. So it is a good question. Uh, you might be in a position where you have to uh, pay up possibly to buy back the call higher than $1.80, but that would actually be a good thing. I mean, you actually want that to happen because it means your stock has moved in your favor and the stock price moving higher is going to have a greater influence on profitability uh, compared to any loss potentially on the option. Okay, good question. And let's move on now to uh, the topic of the day. We'll spend uh, the rest of the next 10 to 15 minutes here on collars. And this is, uh, there's going to be a few interesting things to talk about here with collars, but more, uh, most simply, it's combining those two previous strategies. It's going to look like a covered call on the upside. It's going to look like a protective put on the downside. Now, it is not doubling the size of the stock position. It is simply taking that same 100 shares and selling a call up top and buying a put down below. But I will say the collar is a risk management protective position. The driving force behind the motivation of this trade is the protective put. This is not an effort to increase returns, to generate income, because the cost of the put and the, uh, the receipt of capital from the covered call are more or less gonna cancel each other out. You're not trying to generate income, you want protection, but you're trying to reduce the cost of that protection by using a, a covered call uh, up top. It's risk reducing in nature. And that is where you're going to start as you construct the collar. You look to the downside first. Where is the protection that you want? And then from there, you fill in um, uh, putting this, the strategy together. I got, I've got an example on the next slide so we can look at it a little deeper. But one of the circumstances that uh, comes across my desk quite often on when the collar is used is when a, an investor is scaling down a concentrated position um, and, and they would like to possibly get out of a large position at higher and higher stock uh, share price levels while they have a hedge in place should something bad occur. i um, just going to spend a minute here on concentrated position. Uh, investors will ask, what is that First of all, what does it mean? And then what, what specifically would be a concentrated position? Well, concentrated, of course, just means that you have one particular position or maybe more than one that is, uh, is too big. It's outsized. It's taking up too much of a percentage of your overall portfolio. That's a concentrated position. Further from there, you might say, well, what percentage would that be? Well, how do I know? What's, what is considered concentrated? Um, and this is, of course, where there's ambiguity from one investor to the next, from one trade to the next. The way I answer that question is the, uh, the more familiar you are with a particular trade or stock or position, the higher percentage you're likely willing to tolerate in your portfolio. Uh, if you follow a company far beyond just its earnings report and a loose look at its technicals, but you are diving deep, joining conference calls, tracking the decisions made at the board, uh, tracking changes for the decision makers uh, at the executive level. You know their industry. You track the earnings reports of its competitors. You really know that stock inside and out, and you have a high degree of confidence in its uh, business model and share price appreciation. You might be willing to tolerate 20, 25, maybe 30% of your portfolio in that one position. It's possible. If you're tracking positions more loosely, which is perfectly fine, and you're, you're looking at positions maybe uh, a few times a week and you uh, do a snapshot of technicals, maybe a snapshot of fundamentals, or maybe you're tracking someone's guidance or taking trade advice, uh, tracking loosely, nothing wrong with that. But in that situation, uh, you might be looking at a lower percentage before it's starting to become too much risk for your portfolio. And again, that's different for everybody. Is that 8%, 12, 15, it's gonna be different for each investor. Uh, no matter what your situation, you know, I would say pretty clearly, uh, most people in the industry would say, once you get above that 30% level and you have a third or more 
of your money in one position, you are concentrated. And then you have to decide how comfortable are you with that concentrated position. Uh, and that's when the, the covered call come, could come into place. Um, the, the idea with the covered call, with the, um, sorry, the collar come into place, the idea is that you're protecting this position uh, that potentially could cause great outsized losses should it underperform the broad market while giving yourself the opportunity to enjoy continued gains uh, as you're selling calls to the upside, which uh, may call away some of your shares, or it might not. If the share price continues to slowly appreciate, you might be able to continue to hold that entire position and enjoy gains, uh, even if it's concentrated uh, with that protection in place. Uh, so that's the rationale. The protective put is there. Uh, and the out of the money call is sold. So you don't have to keep paying for downside protection and you're willing to start scaling down if uh, your sh uh, shares start to get called away through the calls. Uh, call strike and put strike are going to be, be uh, determined on basically more or less on price and where that put strike deductible that I described earlier might fall into place. Let's look at an example here. Mike, clean things up a little bit. Long shares of stock. Uh, at 75. Now, this, this is, makes the, the uh, PL graph easier to draw, but most likely, if you're doing the collar, uh, you've either built up a position over time or you've held these, these shares for an awfully long period of time, and now it's up at 75. Um, a, a little extension of that comment in this market environment, many of you may find yourselves in a position where uh, one particular stock has rallied to a, signif a significant amount over the past six months or year or 18 months. And all of a sudden, this stock position that you opened that was 10% of your portfolio is now 20 or 22 or 25% of your portfolio because it's rallied so much and the dollar value is so high. That could lead you to feeling like you're susceptible to a downside move. It's hard to to exit the best performing trade in your portfolio. But sometimes you have to keep an eye on that uh, to make sure that one position doesn't get too outsized. So likely this stock position has been built up over time. Your cost basis is much lower than 75. But we'll say for our purposes here today that you do have shares at 75. That's your break even point. You wanna protect the downside. This is your driving force behind the collar position. Protect the downside. You select 67.5 as the area you wanna make sure you don't give up any more than that. And you look to that 67 half put and you see that it's trading for $1.30. Now the calls, similar to how you selected covered calls, where are you willing to start giving up shares? And then how much premium am I gonna get for that strike? One investor might think 90 is an awful lot. I can move this up. Maybe I'll look at the 85 strike. I'm willing to take less. Another investor might say, well, I don't like 90. I want more. I'm going to look at the 80 strike and try to get more premium. It's up to you. Uh, but here we went an equal amount from the current stock level, $7.5 each way, and we paid a net debit of 40 cents. Now, here's where I'll talk just for a minute about implied volatility. As you notice, equidistant from 75, and we're paying a net debit. Now, why would that be? It's really the classic, uh, classic characteristic of options is I'm going to try to draw in to the best of my ability. I don't have, I don't have very good skills using the drawing tools here on PowerPoint, but I will try. So here I'm going to draw in a volatility skew. This is the implied volatility level. Implied volatility being one of the variables or inputs into a pricing model the implied volatility level, and the strike price. K is the strike price. And here's your at the money. I'm drawing in the dash for the at the money level. Um, now you can calculate a unique implied volatility level for each strike price and then connect the dots. And I'll draw in what more or less is considered to be the most common classic uh, volatility curve. That's just the result of plotting implied vol at each strike price and then connecting these dots and seeing how this lays out. And this is the volatility curve, also known as the volatility skew. 
Uh, the reason why it looks like this, and these would be your put strikes on the bottom, your call strikes up top. We know calls are used to speculate. We do know that. Put options are also used to speculate. But as you've heard a lot here today, put options are also used frequently for protection. And because of that added demand to buy put options for protection, particularly cheap put options that trade for a nickel or a dime or a quarter, they hold their value. There's higher value, higher demand for put options. Uh, sellers are also not willing to sell put options uh, as aggressively as they might sell calls because of the risk of quick downside moves in the market, the risk associated with the obligations of the put option. They're looking for more premium. So higher demand, higher premium amounts for puts translates into higher implied volatility levels. And this really isn't something mysterious. Again, implied vol and changes in implied vol. Some investors might, might not feel like they don't quite understand what's going on. Uh, what, what does it mean? Applied vol going higher, implied vol going lower, implied vol skew. It really all comes down to the balance between buyers and sellers. Another way of saying the balance between supply and demand of options. If there are more buyers, prices go up. When prices go up, implied vol goes up. That's all it means. When prices go down, that's the result of more sellers, more supply, prices coming down, implied vol comes down with it. Across strike prices, which is what I'm drawing here, there's also various levels of demand, various levels of balance between buyers and sellers. Across strike prices, put options tend to have more demand, hence higher prices and higher implied vol levels, calls have less than their put counterparts. That leads you to this dynamic of equidistant strikes, but different premium amounts for calls and puts with the puts being higher net debit. A few other quick things about implied vol. Uh, you might see the bottoming out here. I did, I did draw this intentionally to bottom out just above at the money. That tends to be the case where you see that bottoming out. Uh, you can think of this in layman's terms as the level, uh, say when the market is just slowly drifting higher, gradually drifting higher, uh, that is the most calm, peaceful market environment you could possibly have. So those strike prices, just a little bit higher than at the money tend to be where implied vol bottoms out. And the other uh, comment before we move on regarding uh, implied vol is that this skew that I'm drawing here, although common and sometimes expected, uh, really doesn't have to be the case. I'm gonna draw in a few others in, in different colors here. Uh, there's no rule uh, that says that implied vol skews have to look a certain way. You can have other looking skews. Uh, this green volatility skew is symmetrical. The demand for puts and the demand for calls is the same. I would say most commonly you might experience this in commodity underlying. So corn, silver, gold, oil, those types of underlying products might have symmetrical skews where the speed of movement's higher and the speed of movement's lower might be about the same. And so you don't have that element of more protection to the downside than the upside. And here's an inverted skew. Calls trade for more. There's more demand. There's higher prices for calls and there are for puts. Um, the classic example there might be an underlying whose price behavior is the opposite of the overall market. Think of the VIX, for example. I don't know exactly where the VIX is today, but recently I was checking it. I think it was around 15 or 16 or so. If you take the VIX at 15, and you look at the $10 puts, you're gonna see no bid at the $10 level. How often does the VIX ever get below 10? Uh, it's just not gonna happen. So no bid at going down to 10. But if you go up to 20, you would certainly see bids and prices as market participants are using the VIX to protect their portfolios by buying calls. You'd also see bids at the 30, 40, 50 level in the VIX because it behaves in the opposite fashion. Equities really could take on any one of these forms, any one of them. And at times they do. At times you do see it, an equity inverted or symmetrical. Uh, you probably uh, will notice that if you bounce around to different equities uh, and see the different various curves. One quick way to do that, by the way, and I know I'm rambling about implied vol here, but one quick way to take a snapshot, if the, if the at the money uh, level, the, the current stock price is 100, you can quickly look on your options chain at the 90 put and the 110 call and just look and see which one's trading for more or are they trading for the same level? You can look at the 80 put and the 120 call 
and look again, what's the premium? Is the put higher? Is the call higher? Are they the same? And very quickly, you can get a semblance for what type of skew are you dealing with? If the 120 call is trading higher than the 80 put, you're dealing with an inverted skew to some extent. And you might be able to put on this collar for a credit rather than a debit. So all sorts of things going on there, but uh, in the interest of time, I got to move on from applied vol. Otherwise, I'll keep talking about it forever. Uh, but here you have uh, this example, and I do want to uh, put up some of the math. Uh, I'm not going to walk through the math, but the math is here uh, for you to look at what's your maximum gain, uh, stock price up to your strike price of the call option, and then incorporate the debit of the options piece. You've got your max loss, the deductible. Uh, from your, your stock price down to your strike to the put. And you have to also incorporate your debit there and break even. In this case, our break even increased a little bit because we paid for our options piece. So instead of our stock break even at 75, it's actually a little higher at 75.40. Uh, not too difficult to understand the collar there as it really is just a combination of covered call and protective put. Um, but as we do move forward here, I want to look at variations. This will only take a few minutes, but um, options are a flexible tool. You can do so many different things with options. And one of the things that I always like to point out is you can take a classic uh, definition or structure of a strategy and do something else with it that tweaks it to your liking. You can do this with the covered call. You can do this with iron condor. You can do this with all sorts of strategies. So, you know, I understand the strategy, but I think I want to make it look a little bit different because I like the variation a little bit more. And it's not gonna be the collar, it's gonna resemble the collar. And you can do this with all sorts of strategies. Uh, so let's look at, at a few of these. And again, I'm not gonna go into tremendous detail here. I just wanna get the point across that there's flexibility for you to do other things that are a little bit different than the collar I just described to you. One of those would be selling short dated calls and buying longer term puts. Why would you do that? What would be advantages and disadvantages of doing shorter data calls, sort of staggered uh, expiration dates, staggered collar, staggered expiration dates? Uh, for those of you familiar with time decay, it is faster for shorter dated options. So faster time decay would benefit your shorter calls as your decay on the short option would be faster than the decay on your longer option. That works out well for you. If the calls are unassigned, you can continue to sell short dated calls that experience faster rate of decay. In fact, for this staggered expiration date approach to work, you would have to be able to do this. You would have to be able to continue selling short dated calls because each of those calls you sold is going to have a lower premium amount. You need to keep uh, adding those premiums one after the other after the other in order for this to work out. Uh, what would be a disadvantage? The longer data put has more premium, of course, than the shorter data call you received. Uh, so the initial trade, the initial composition of the staggered expiration collar uh, would show a, a great, I don't say greater, but and, and possibly great initial debit out of your account. That's something to consider. Initially, you have a significant debit to consider. And further, uh, if there's a large move in either direction and you then don't have the ability to keep selling these short dated calls to let those premiums add up, that would be the case. If there was a huge move lower or a huge move higher, you're not going to be able to continue selling these short dated calls. Uh, and this staggered expiration would not work out for you. A couple of things to consider, uh, but something you certainly could do. Another example, put spread collar. Uh, you might have noticed that the standard collar, the long put, provides you protection all the way down to zero. You might decide, I don't need all that protection. It's too much. I don't need all that. So instead of doing the classic uh, collar strategy, you might be able to save money or improve your uh, initial options piece by selling a further out of the money put. You do add a level of complexity here. So I'm going to throw up a PL graph of this put spread collar so you can see uh, what exactly you're doing here. Uh, this gets a little bit messy because of the different pieces, but I'll walk through it quickly. So here you have uh, this investor was long stock from 105. You see that here, the stock has rallied, and now we're going to implement a put spread collar. Uh, 
so look at how the, the shape of this, if the stock's at 120, just look to the upside. Well, this shouldn't be surprising. This looks like the covered call. We can rally from the stock price up to the share price and then shares get called away. And the reason why all of this is profitable is because in our example here on this one, we're already profitable. Long stock 105, stock's currently at 120. So we're looking at more of a protective strategy. So here you have the covered call look on the upside. On the downside, this looks exactly like the collar. We lose on the share price until we get to our long strike. And then we have protection. Now, if this was the collar, that protection would remain in place all the way to zero. You might decide, I don't need all of that. If I'm going to buy a 115 put for 360, I don't need to spend all that money because I'm not concerned about the stock dropping that much. So I'm going to be willing to give away my protection, give away the insurance below a price of 105. And you would accomplish that by selling the 105 put uh, receiving premium. And now instead of having a cost of the collar, you've translated that into a credit because you're selling two options instead of one. Certainly an added layer of complexity. We're getting a little bit deeper. If you're not familiar with the collar, um, you know, some of this might need to uh, take some time to digest. Uh, but really this piece up here looks just like the traditional collar. Uh, but because we're not concerned about the huge downside move, and we're, we're uh, uh, trying to receive more premium with this spread collar, we're gonna give up protection and that's the strike we sell. And now we, uh, we know that if the stock were to, to really crash hard, uh, we're exposed to losses down at that lower lowest level. And the last variation uh, that I'm gonna talk through is just this laddered uh, collar to stagger strikes and stagger expiration dates if you are long say 500 shares and you wanna protect it. You buy five put options and you can go out six months and buy your put options for a rather hefty $4 each. And now instead of selling five options at one particular strike price and one particular expiration date, you can stagger this any way you want and sell an option at various strike prices, various expiration dates and various premium amounts and see how that works out for you. Now, you're probably not gonna go out six months to sell options. I'm just using that to highlight the latest expiration of the calls you sell. The latest would have to be at or before the expiration date of your puts. Uh, but I would say most option sellers don't wanna go this far out. They're gonna sell their options within 60 days. Uh, but staggering strikes, staggering expirations, that gives the stock room to run from 100 to 105. You'd only lose 100 shares. From 100 up to 110, you'd only lose another 100. Now you go up to one, uh, 115, you're able to more or less scale out of the position as you go out in time and up uh, in value. Uh, so different, uh, different ways to do that. Uh, of course, you don't even have to sell all five. Uh, of these options. If you wanted to sell four or sell three, uh, have the protection in place, but I'm only going to sell four calls instead of five in case the uh, share price really rallies uh, significantly. Uh, if it does rally in a big way, uh, then, uh, then you have at least 100 shares or more to, uh, to uh, capitalize on that big run uh, to the upside. So a lot there were pretty much on time here, but I did have a question that I wanted to get to as I uh, put up uh, some details with the option. And I'll turn it over to them in just a second. Um, but let's see. So what are, the what are the incentives, a question here, for an in-the-money call option buyer to exercise right before ExDiv if the time premium left in that option is greater than the dividend amount? Really good question here. Um, if the time premium in the option is truly greater than the dividend amount, and I'll further say, if the in-the-money call holder can capture that time value through a sell-to-close transaction, and they want the dividend, it would be in their best interest to sell the option, sell to close the option, capture that time value, and then buy the shares in the open market and capture the dividend. 
There's no reason they have to give away time value. Now, I'll further say, if you encountered this situation, in reality, and I'll admit I don't track option premiums uh, on a regular basis on uh, days prior to XDIV, but in the experience that I've had 20 plus years, in the money options prior to XDIV generally do not provide the call holder with the opportunity to sell their option and capture any time value. Uh, so in practice, now, I don't see that available to the option holder. And if it's not available, if they cannot sell the option for more than parity or more than its intrinsic value, then they are not able to capture time premium. And that leaves them with the choice of either holding the call and suffering from that share price decline or exercising early to become a shareholder and, uh, and capture the dividend payment. One other thing here, and I want this could be a very long, I don't want to make it too complicated, but the synthetic version of the long call from a risk perspective is being a long stock, long put. So if the call holder exercises and becomes a shareholder, you might be thinking, well, now they own stock. They have risk to the downside, significant risk. Yes, that's true. They do. If the call holder wanted to maintain the same level of risk, they would need to accomplish the synthetic call, which is buying stock, in other words, exercising into shares, and buying the put option at that same strike price. So another way to look at this, because this dividend conversation could get complicated, another way to look at the decision to exercise early for the call holder is, will this dividend amount that I'm going to receive as a shareholder be greater then the cost of the put option I'm going to have to buy if I want to maintain the same risk profile. And you'll hear some traders say just that. Now, how do I know if I'm going to exercise early from in the money option? They'll just simply say, if the dividend amount is greater than the price of the put, you'll hear that explanation as well. Uh, and again, that's for the investor that doesn't want all the risk associated with long stock. And they're going to buy the put option to maintain that same synthetic position. Uh, let's see, one more question. We'll see uh, what we've got here. Isn't another benefit of the protected put a way to gain profit on trades that make a down from our initial plan? Um, I believe this, this uh, question is trying to say that isn't there a way to profit off of the put itself um, as, a, as a benefit from your initial plan? I think that's where this question is going. Um, if, the, if the share price does decline, of course, your, your put option could certainly go up tremendously in value. Yes, that's true. If you did sell to close or exercise your put, the profit of the put would be there, but you would not certainly have a net overall profit. Similar to that question I got earlier about the covered call, the stock price is going to be the driving force behind the trade. Uh, that covered call description I gave earlier, yeah, you might have to pay back and take a loss on it. But that's okay because the stock price is the driving force behind profitability and you will be a net gainer. Same question really here, but on the other side with the put option, if the stock were to decline, you would have a nice gain, possible profit on your put option. However, the stock is going to be the driving force behind profitability and the net between the two is going to be negative. The protective put is really a way to protect losses, but not to profit. Um, one thing, uh, this question coming from Dennis, you know, one other way to look at this, uh, to try and translate that into the possibility to profit is um, uh, you could sell the put to close at a profit and just hold your stock position. Let's say the stock really craters down to a very low level and you're thinking, hey, this is support. This stock is going to rally here. Uh, and maybe this was the angle this question was coming from to begin with. You could sell the put option for a profit and then basically hold the stock and get rid of your insurance, get rid of the protection. So profit on the put, and then hopefully see the stock turn around and go in your favor. That's one way to manage the position. Um, just keeping in mind that if you did take that approach, you are now getting rid of the protective put and your profitability would be then dependent on where the stock goes from there. Okay, I uh, did go a, little, a bit over time. So thanks for, uh, for tuning in. Thanks for the questions. I hope everyone found the presentation useful. And uh, I will uh, kick things back to Gina to wrap things up. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Ed. That was very interesting and informative. 
And a big thank you to all of our attendees for being here today as well. And just a quick wrap up, if you look up at the screen at eOption, we do offer zero for unlimited stock and ETF trades and option contracts are just 10 cents per contract. So we'll hope, we hope that you'll give eOption a close look uh, for your trading needs. And as we've said earlier, we do have more videos on option trading on our YouTube channel, which, which we recently revamped. And no matter what level you're at, if you're a beginner or more advanced, you'll find uh, interesting videos on all types of strategies from covered calls to various spreads to using our trading platform and our technology as well as our free tools. So we hope that you'll go to www.youtube.com slash eOption and subscribe today. And for a very limited time, uh, once this goes live on YouTube, which will be tomorrow, we will have a special promotion. You'll find it in the description uh, just after the YouTube video um, in the text. And we will be giving a free uh, cryptocurrency stock to anyone who opens an account in the next, uh, for I, I believe it's the next week or two. So you'll definitely wanna check that out. And if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, you'll be notified as soon as that video is available. We also offer many free resources. And one of the quick ones I wanted to highlight was options play. So that's normally $500 annually if you were getting that on your own, but we offer that free to all of our customers. And what that does is that highlights, that basically scans thousands of stocks each day and highlights potential option trade opportunities for you based on your goals that you enter into the system. So we encourage you to check that out. And we do have videos on our website and YouTube channel on that as well. And then last, if you go to www.eoption.com, we do have more option strategy resources there. Uh, we have webinars, uh, videos, and clickable strategy links. So we encourage you to check that out. And if, you, if you're interested in opening an account, of course, you can go there and you'll find all the account opening application information. So again, thank you so much for your time. We greatly appreciate it. Have a wonderful afternoon, and we hope you and your loved ones have a very nice Thanksgiving. Bye now.